ready to talk about the uh, the facade. I had always wanted to uh, try writing a novel. So when I when I got through my PhD exams, you know, the art department, a lot of the people in our department, it was sort of an unspoken tradition that once you passed your exams, you sort of took a year off. You know, there were guys who would tinker at their house or tinker at their car, and I thought, well, I'm I'm going to write a novel. Uh, that's what I'm going to do, just because I was kind of burned out. So I had a, a good job. I, you know, to do that, I, I worked late night, third shift as a security guard. That's what I did going through grad school. One of, well, one of about three or four jobs anyway. So I had long chunks of time, and I thought, well, I'm going to take the first year, what should be my dissertation, and do something fun. <laughs> so that's what I decided to do. I figured, you know, I've always been interested in paranormal stuff. Uh, I got seriously interested in UFO stuff um, in uh, 1997. I, I had been interested up to that point, but there was that was sort of a watershed year for me. And so I I thought, well, l let's throw you know all this stuff into the blender, you know, so to speak, and, and see what comes out. I had a command of ancient texts. I I knew a good bit about the UFO stuff. I mean, I I was a regular listener to Coast to Coast, so I was sort of up to date on all the crazy conspiracy you know kinds of talk. And I thought, why not? You know, let's just throw it all in there and see what comes out. And I wanted it to be, uh, I wanted everything in the book to be factual. In other words, I could trace it somewhere to, you know, credible research material. Uh, and, and so that's, that was the, the approach, the tactic. But then, of course, the story was, you know, made up essentially how I connected all those dots. And it, it was fun. I mean, I, uh, to this day, it, it is the most fun thing I do is to, is to write fiction. I'm, I'm, I, there's a sequel out now to the facade, but I, I'm really looking forward to doing number three because it, it really is fun. It's, it's a diversion uh, for me. For the sequel, I, I wasn't sure. It took a long time to produce a sequel because I had to go back to my dissertation. Then I had to get, I had a real job and, and whatnot, and, and I wasn't sure that I could pull off a sequel because I didn't have the long stretches of time. So, the real question was, can you do this? in like hour long segments um you know is that possible because i i hadn't done it that way before so i had to i had to sort of retrain myself to do number two you know i i, I more or less just decided well i have to make a file because i kind of like the idea of not only at, at the chapter headings i wanted to use quotes but you know somewhere there, there are occasions within the the context of the story that that's useful so yeah i've, I've collected a good number of them in terms of, of the facade, uh, there were certain descriptions, you know, of, of like the cattle mutilation thing that I thought were were really um, kind of astonishing, very surprising. Uh, so I, I would say some of that stuff. Uh, there are a few again suggestive quotes that I I thought were real uh, eye catching that I that I didn't expect. I have a different context for those. Uh, now and, and and the reader might as well once they're through the the, the second book, but I mean they're they're there you know that that stuff's out there you can you can find it and track it down and you know what what you make of it of course you know is why I used it uh, that it's not something that uh, you know is really easily explainable um, so it was really good fodder you know for for what I was doing. The government is not above manipulating citizens to propel a certain narrative or, or a certain misdirection. And so, you know, in, in the book, you you are confronted with real things, but then the, the reader is also confronted with, well, what we thought was this, maybe it's that. And there's a lot of that in the facade, which, of course, is why it, get, it gets the name that it gets, because there are competing intelligences, let's just put it that way, uh, that are trying to move the herd in different directions, and that uh, you know, the, the the greater evil intelligence is 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 using the lesser ones, but that only the reader knows that the characters don't know that. Um, so the so the reader actually gets a a more in depth glimpse of how the facade is working and what the facade actually is. Uh, you know, moving the reader to, toward those those directions and those sorts of things, uh, like mirage men, uh, they they happen in real time. You know, in in you know, our own situation. And for a novel like The Facade, they're very illustrative uh, and useful, again, to, you know, just get across the thought that, well, what you what you thought this is might not be what it is. What what you think you know may not be so, that sort of thing. I don't read much fiction. Um, 
but you know, I was a big fan of the X Files and, and you know shows like that. I like misdirection, so I wanted to to make that a heavy component uh, of the story. And there's lots of misdirection uh, in in the facade. And as far as the the, the storyline goes, I thought, well, what what better premise, you know, to sort of start off with? It would be, what would the impact be? on you know traditional conservative you know quote unquote bible believing christianity if a genuine extraterrestrial disclosure happened you know something that was basically undeniable and so that became the orienting focus of of, of the story and and the main character who is who's basically me i mean I, and i did that because i'd never written fiction before so i had to know somebody <laughs> i had to know one character at least uh, in the novel, and so Brian, the, the the lead character, is basically me. When I was in in college, you know that that those sort of years, um, with with all his his uh, insecurities and 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 whatnot. So, I wanted to confront him with that question, and he becomes again the the main focus that that sort of propels the story. And then it, it morphs at one point to well, what if we thought and and we had demonstrated to us was a genuine disclosure? What if what if it wasn't? What if it was something worse, uh, at least potentially? And so those two thoughts, you know, are what propel the story. One at the beginning, and then it, you have this transition and this, you know, there's this disagreement. You know, people don't quite know what to do with what they were told uh, as as they work their way through the story. He's basically ab- abducted by a couple of guys, uh, you know, agents, sort of men in black kind of figures, um, and he does you know, obviously he's. He's so out of place in this. Uh, he, he doesn't have a job. He's just, you know, he's made it through graduate school. His parents have been murdered. He's he's basically going nowhere. He doesn't really have much of a future. And why he would be a subject of interest really to anyone uh, for anything is is kind of a conundrum to him. But he finds out that the connection is is a professor he had uh, while he was in college that that. Uh, sort of a mentor figure uh, for him when and he's a pretty isolated person you know Brian is and so th- that sort of gets sorted out as to why he was chosen uh, to do this particular thing that his friend is involved with his friend is very highly placed uh, in the intelligence community he was a political science professor and so that's how he gets drawn into the whole set of circumstances Andrew, uh, Father Benedict, uh, was sort of my nod to Malachi Martin, mm-hmm. uh, very famous Jesuit scholar, and he was a he was a legit scholar. I've I've seen his dissertation, one of them anyway. Um, and so I, I wanted to again have this little nod, you know, to to Martin, and I thought I would use Benedict to do that because Benedict prods Brian to certain conclusions that Benedict uh, suspects, and and Brian is a bit hesitant to sort of go there. And so I wanted to use that relationship to try to, you know, move Brian along, not in a suspicious way, but of course, in the story, you don't really know if he's going off in the wrong direction or if he's heading in the right direction. Yeah, but but Benedict was, was very useful for that. Useful for that, and and Benedict is sort of, other than the the political science guy who's kind of in a leadership role, Benedict is the one who essentially becomes you know brian's friend i mean he he makes other friends in in the group but he's the immediate connection because of their their religious uh background and benedict is familiar with brian's work which brian thinks is just like boy i didn't know i i I didn't think anybody had ever read anything i did (laughs) and 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 his connection of course not only to benedict but also to the the other fellow neil banstra um is an article he wrote about the implications of extraterrestrial life for again the the conservative you know Bible believer you know he Brian had been teaching at a Bible college right out of grad school and this article leads to him getting fired and so he had again he has no future he's basically going nowhere but but his conversations with Neil again his old professor from Johns Hopkins really struck a nerve with Neil when Neil is drawn into this sort of dark murky black op world and the extraterrestrial question gets put on the table. Brian is the first person he thinks of that could help him think well uh, about what he's been, you know, thrown into. There's a character who gets, you know, meets an unfortunate end, uh, Mantello, Father Mantello, who's an astronomer, who is a real person, by the way, not a, not a, a priest, but 
in fact, as we speak here, a week ago, I, I had another meeting with Mantello. So uh, again, there, there's a real person behind that who does what Mantello does mm -hmm. uh, in real life. But I wanted to, again, acknowledge that they are ahead of the curve. But Benedict is someone who, again, he's a Jesuit. And so he's well aware of this. And Benedict has, has a lot going on in his own history. But again, he's my, that's my nod to, to Martin. Benedict is very suspicious of the authority structures in the church. Uh, he does believe that they have been uh, infected by darkness. And so he, he's also there for that reason, to help Brian potentially, again, navigate who his friends might be and who, who to look out for, uh, that sort of thing. But, but you don't really know a whole lot about Benedict uh, in the story. And, and as the story goes on, you start to learn more and more. And, and the reader is led to think, well, you know, what about this guy? Melissa is very hostile. Uh, and, and again, the reader eventually learns where that comes from. But she is very condescending. She's cruel to him in particular. Uh, she has you know, some serious anger issues. Uh, and again, because of her own uh, history. And, and she is not only personally and professionally antagonistic to him, but she also is a good, a good Melissa is a, a good thinker. She's a good character for uh, one who would suspend judgment, and even when when Brian takes a turn in this or that direction, Melissa is there to to sort of keep him in check, sometimes in an, in a conscious or an unconscious way. But she has really no time at all uh, for him or what for Brian or what he stands for. There's another quote in the book from someone named Donna Hare who talks about uh, UFOs being regularly airbrushed out of photos before they were they were publicly released. Mm -hmm. And these are real people, you know, who who worked at NASA. Um, they they see things, they hear things, they think things on the basis of what they uh, see, hear, and think. They they draw their own conclusions. Um, you know, the the real question in my mind with all of that sort of stuff is: Are they processing the reality behind what they're hearing, seeing? Uh, correctly, uh, that, to me, it always comes down to that. You know, uh, maybe what's being airbrushed out. Okay, it is an unidentified flying object, but does that mean it's extraterrestrial? Well, you know, if you ask Donna Hare, she would have that suspicion because why else are you airbrushing them out of out of photos? You know, and, and there could be other explanations, but you know, she and the UFO community are going to go one particular direction with that. Uh, somebody else would go a different direction with that. But yeah, it's it's all that sort of matrix of, um, you know, real lore <laughs> when it comes to, uh, NASA and, and UFOs. And, and I would say what, what else is up there that, you know, the, the public is being shielded from again, it, it can go a couple of different directions, all of which are fascinating. Um, and that, again, that's just good material for, for a book like the facade. The, the quotes in there, because that is a particular Bible myth that I think really needs to be disposed of for all sorts of reasons. It, it's very poor thinking to to think, again, in, in, in its most simplistic terms, that it can't be real unless it's mentioned in the Bible. Well, you know, toilet paper is real, okay? Right. You know, <laughs> we know about planets beyond Saturn and nobody in the ancient world, you know, knew that for sure. Uh, we know about microwaves. You know, we know about germ, how germs travel through the bloodstream. I mean, there, there, there are just tens of thousands of things that are demonstrably real that are not in the Bible. So if that's your mentality about the Bible, you're thinking very poorly. And in, in a lot of these, these examples that I just gave, they're fairly trivial. But there are really important things that if you take that same approach to the Bible— and of course, in the in the case of the book, it's about are there extraterrestrials? Mm -hmm. There are some really big picture things that are really important that to use the same approach, the same hermeneutic could potentially uh, set you up for a fall as a Bible believer and set the Bible up, make it vulnerable to ridicule. And I think that needs to just be dispensed with. What's in the mind of God, again, even if God wanted and tried and succeeded in giving us everything in the mind of God, we're not going to be able to process that. You know, the, the, the Bible is a very selective, focused, intelligently crafted book. It accomplishes the purposes to which God wanted it uh, to, to succeed. And so I think we just need to think better about what was the point in even producing the thing. In 1997, I was listening uh, to the CNN press conference. 
for the 50th anniversary. And again, I, I had read enough about Roswell to know, you know, the basic framework of the story and what the issues were. And, and at the CNN conference uh, the, the, that was being conducted by a guy named Colonel Haynes uh, from the Air Force, and this was the Air Force's third explanation for Roswell, which, which alone tells you something. But uh, a, a reporter at the press conference asked Colonel Haynes, you know, he said, well, you know, you know, Colonel Haynes, you know, the Air Force has reported here that uh, the, the bodies, the so-called bodies that were found at Roswell, you know, the crash site, were actually Air Force test dummies. But the report of the Air Force itself notes that these test dummies were not used until the early 1950s. So how do you explain that because of the event in 1947? And what I thought the colonel would say is, well, yeah, that, okay, that's a typo. I misspoke. You know, th- thank you. And then here's the real answer. But he didn't. He stuck to the report. <laughs> he said, yes, that's correct. And the reporter's like, well, how, you know, everybody, we're sitting here in 1997. It's the 50th anniversary. So what, how do those two things go together? And the colonel actually said, and I went out and got the transcript from the CNN conference right after I heard it because I couldn't believe it. He said, well, we think that the witnesses to the Roswell event uh, have undergone time compression. And he's like, what's that? <laughs> and and, what, he, and th- what the colonel meant was, well, we think that, that these witnesses thought that they were recalling something from 1947, but it was actually something that happened in the early 1950s, which is where you get the, the, the crash test dummies you know, into the picture. And I, I listened to that and I thought, that answer is so ridiculous Somebody somewhere wants this myth to live because we're not talking four or five people. When it comes down to the Roswell event, you're talking about a couple hundred. And, and the event itself was in newspapers across the country, mm-hmm. you know, picked it up from the Roswell, you know, Daily Record. And, and it was so absurd to offer this as an explanation that that was the only conclusion I could draw. And that really sucked me into the whole thing because I – when I heard that, I thought, you know, I, I, I want to know. I want to know why somebody – here we have an Air Force colonel, you know, who I imagine, you know, showed up for work that day and got a phone call from a general and, that said, son, you're going to go out today and serve your country no matter how dumb you sound. <laughs> you know, like, like this is what you're going to say. Take one for the team. You know, like somebody somewhere wants this myth to live. And I, I was just sort of fascinated by why. And I think in, in hindsight – this is a convenient and, and effective, and, and I'll, I'll use the, the word important, misdirection uh, to, to people within the military industrial complex. They, they had their reasons uh, for doing what they did and, and, and again, looking stupid uh, like this that uh, were important. But for the sake of the facade, yeah, I didn't want to miss that because that was sort of a watershed moment for me that took me from sort of a casual you know, interest to there's just something here that needs to be you know thought about needs to be understood since i had not done it before and i what i did for the facade and i actually did this for the portent the, the sequel as well every scene i played through my head like i was watching a movie so there were there were times not so much with the facade because i had these big chunks of time but for the second one my wife my wife could tell you there were times i went and i sat down at the desk and I just sat there for an hour, and that was the time I had, and, and we're done now. But it was productive because I had now seen the scene, you know, five, six, ten times. I know who's in the room. I know who's saying what. I know who hears something and who doesn't hear something. I know how they hear. I mean, it, again, you you just you play it through your head, so that the next night I can sit down and just rattle the whole thing out because I I had played it and replayed it again and again and again. And that's essentially what I do. I, if this were a movie, what would I be looking at? What would I be watching? Uh, and you know, trying to pay attention to, to all those sorts of details. I, I actually like fiction more, I, but I also think it's harder because you know, it, with, with nonfiction, you're not making stuff up. You're doing research. You, know, you, you pull this or that out. You, know, you, you do the work ahead of time. You know the lay of the land, that sort of thing. Uh, with, with fiction, that isn't the case. Now, I, I've actually had two different experiences here. With the facade, I actually outlined the entire book before I really got into it. And then I would, again, like I said, I would play each scene in my head. So I sort of knew from the very beginning 
what was going to happen, how everything was going to unfold. Now, there were changes because it's true. When you write fiction, your characters sort of take over the story. And so I would get to points in my outline and just know, no, nah, Melissa wouldn't do that. <laughs> she wouldn't say that. There's no way Brian would do you know. So then it would change. Now, for the, for the portent, though, I, I didn't have that luxury. I knew uh, segments. I knew scenes. And so the, the issue was how to connect them. And that was more of an ad hoc thing, at least in part just because of my, my circumstances where I had to uh, approach that. I mean, the playing it through my head, that that's consistent. Uh, but as far as kind of knowing precisely where things were going, I didn't so much in, in, in the portent. It, it was, that was a slower uh, part of the process. So that's difficult you know, because you, you, it does force you to redo scenes. Um, I, no, I don't want this person in the room. Or let me change one word here that will affect the way you know, what the reader is thinking, because you're always trying to, to make the reader think a certain thought, either correctly or in terms of misdirection. Uh, there are always drifts to catch. Uh, and you want to lay the breadcrumb trail for when they get to the end and they think, well, how in the world? And then they go back, and, okay, I, now I, I know what was going on here. Uh, that's really difficult, uh, much more difficult in my experience than, you know, cranking out a conference paper or something like that. Like academic journals do not get put on the internet. So, you know, it, it's just a fallacy. We tend to believe that God only is working in the spectacular. And I think that's very contrary uh, to biblical thinking. God is always at work, and it's typically the unseen hand that uh, really, really matters. The original manuscript, you know, to um, to when the portent actually was available. Yeah, it was pushing a, a long period of time, and we went, you know, we, it went through several, you know, printings and publications and whatnot. So, but between the two, um, you know, I guess I could say, I mean, I I'd, I'd thought a lot about number two. Um, you know, I had to finish my doctoral work while while I wrote the facade. I was in graduate school and. Burned the first year, which should have been my dissertation, to do that, and you know I'm still unrepentant. <laughs> but you know I had to go back to you know to the to the real world and finish my my doctoral program, my dissertation, and then took the job where that I that I have now out here in Washington State. So I thought about it a lot. I, I did I did some UFO conferences, um, you know did lots of interviews, of course, you know re regarding the facade. So I think you know in between I, it, it had a lot of percolation time. And during that time, I, I decided that I really needed to, in the portent, to kind of, I don't know what the right word is, kind of try to address in, in fictional style a few of what I thought were unfortunately misguided ideas that Christians who were into this, you know, might have. And, and here's the thought I had, you know, and this could be a springboard. We could go a lot of directions with this. But when I, when I actually kind of settled down to write the portent, I thought, okay, if I were intelligent evil, you know, if I were the mastermind here, uh, knowing what I know, knowing what readers know at the end of the facade, what would my end game be? And then how would I get there? And, and I, I really feel pretty strongly that a lot of the ways that Christians just generally look at end times because the portent, you know, that the title is, is, you know, an omen of things to come, you know, that kind of thing. A lot of the way that Christians look at end times can be very simplistic. And if you're into, you know, conspiracy stuff and you marry that to your eschatology, it, in my mind, it even gets even more simplistic. But I thought, how would an intelligent evil being use this kind of thinking to his advantage? And so that became kind of the, the well from which I drew a lot of stuff in the portent. And, and I don't want to get in, in maybe into scenes just yet, but there is a particular scene where the, 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 the evil one, you know, looks across at you know, the main uh, protagonist, Brian, and says, I'm going to tell you exactly what we're going to do. 
because you're not going to be able to do a thing about it. And you're going to be the one who knows when you see it happening that it's all a sham and it's designed, you know, to target people like you. So that, that, that was what turned the wheels during the writing of the, of the story. How would intelligent evil use the Bible and biblical misconceptions and, and flawed thinking that a lot of Christians have? How would he use it to his advantage to get what he wants? The typical thinking that's, that gets parroted from, you know, one Christian network to another Christian network. And by network, I mean, you know, series of contacts, not mm-hmm. TV. Uh, and, you know, era to era, church to church, you know, that kind of thing without ever being examined. And, of course, the, the villain, you know, in, in the story, the colonel, does not, is not privy to that conversation, that, that statement of Father Benedict to Brian in, in the facade. But yet he understands Brian well enough to know that this is going to burn within him to, to tell people what he's seen or, and, and his perception of what's going on. And, and so the colonel basically enjoys that. That I, I want you to know what's going on because I want it to hurt. You know, I, 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 wa- I want you to realize that you, you know, you're, you're helpless. You're going you're to basically watch the whole thing burn. You know, this, this thing, believing Christianity, you're going to watch it burn. You're going you're gonna to watch it die by its own hand. And you're going to be one still small voice out there saying, this isn't, this isn't what you think it is. But he basically is going to be able to control and point to all sorts of signs and wonders and other points of validation that, that will drown Brian out. And he knows that. And he's, he's engineering the circumstance by which Brian will, will be in that situation. And, and he could kill him. You know, the, the colonel could kill him at any point. But he, he, just, he just tells him, as long as you are interesting, as long as you sort of amuse me, I'm going to keep you around. And I want it to hurt. One of the big things in both the facade and the portent is the power of the unseen hand, the providence. And the colonel is not in as much control as he thinks he is. And you know, the, the people you know, who are on the right side here are, you know, when it, when it comes to, to uh, you know, facing a supernatural evil, in many regards, they're powerless. But you know, they, they have providence on their side. In many cases, they don't even know it. And so the, the portent deals a lot with think, you know, real simple themes like do the right thing when you can, and you know, trust God that it'll it'll contribute to something. It will accrue to something, and that's what the you know the the good guys in the book try to do. And, and you know they they do what they can. They do what they can. And of course, the you know evil thinks it's in complete control of the situation, but that's not actually the case. <laughs> there are things going on that are unknown uh, to the to the to the powers of darkness as they are. The story, you know, as it unfolds, the reader will understand that the story is the is the fiction. In other words, all the dots are real, but how I connect the dots—that's the fictional part. But I want people to to sort of grasp that again. If if I were intelligent evil, you know, I could use a number of things to manipulate people's thinking. And if I can think of ways to do this, you know, somebody who's actually in, in a position to to do harm and to do evil. And again, intelligent, supernatural evil, they, they can think of ways to do this too, to use real facts, real data, real this or that, to manipulate how people think and then move the herd to where they want them to go, to draw the conclusions they want them to draw. Because if you want to, if you want to affect a mass of people, you have to affect their thinking. You have to make them think the thoughts you want them to think. And I think the best way to do that is to show them things that are real and then tell them how to parse it. You know, that's where the manipulation comes in. He and Melissa, of course, wind up in a situation where they you know, are living together. Um, you know, He wanted it to be, well, let's pretend we're brother and sister, and, and she convinces him like it makes more sense to say we're married. And So it's kind of an awkward relationship. Um, it, it's pretty evident. You know, at the end of the first book, he loves her, but he he just feels like this is just a, I'm so overmatched here. You know, I mean, uh, this, she is just so far out of my league. This is just kind of ridiculous, you know, and, and tries to more or less move on. But he's very protective uh, of her. So, you know, he he wants some sort of arrangement where he can kind of keep an eye on her that, you know, because they he's they're both living under the fear of exposure. Somebody's going to find out who we really are, what happened to us this summer. You know, if they find out, then our enemies are going to find out. So they're just trying to be normal, you know, trying to, to blend in uh, initially. And 
for her, it's working a little bit better than, than it is for him. Well, they encounter um, a, a girl. They're in North Dakota, which is the last place either of them thought they would ever be. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, it's wintertime in North Dakota. And this, this girl comes up to them. They're at the coffee shop. Again, she's Melissa's trying to, to humanize him. So to try to teach him how to act more like like they're a couple. And then this girl just sort of bursts in and she's convinced that she knows who Melissa really is. Like she mm-hmm. recognizes her. And Melissa doesn't put the dots together for a, a little bit. But then, you know, it starts to, to come together and they get into a conversation. And Melissa makes a mistake and sort of, you know, outs them uh, by accident. But it's actually a really important scene because of who the girl is and even more so who who her boyfriend is. They, they, there's this really odd peripheral connection back to some of the things they had encountered uh, over the summer through this girl. But none of them really you know, know that until the girl kind of tells her story and they both mutually agree to you know, not tattle on each other. Yeah, in, in the, the scene in the coffee shop, <clears throat> the, uh, again, the initial one here, where this girl, you know, again, is convinced she knows Melissa because she she had applied to Melissa's graduate program and, and knew her picture from, you know, the, her old school's website, you know, that kind of thing. Well, her, her boyfriend is working in the South Pole and they, they discover something that, that's in an early chapter, uh, pr- chapter prior to this scene. And so that's where the connection comes in. And part of that discovery is... Uh, fragments of a a diary or a blueprint and a blueprint diagram and and that's that's what it is that's where i took both the materials and then the little sort of screenshot uh, fragments uh, of what they discover uh, it's like a, a ele- plans for a hydraulic elevator and, and things like that in, in the antarctic so yeah that that stuff is real um you know i I, I'm, I'm trying not to say too much about it, but it does take the reader back to the whole, is this connected to this post-World War II Operation High Jump thing where conspiracy theorists, you know, have the the allies being assaulted by UFOs when they're chasing Nazis down to, you know, to the Antarctic, you know, they're, they're trying to escape and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. There's, there's something that's going to come up later in the book that a lot of, you know, the conspiracy theorists around the Operation High Jump never really either discover or show people or if they know it they hide it um so there, there's gonna there's gonna be something else that comes along to tie together uh what happens in this scene but the the real purpose of the scene again is, is to alert brian and melissa that there's there's actually something going on there down there right now and of course the the girl her name is becky who, who you know bumps into them she doesn't know any of this, but but they're sitting there thinking, oh boy, you know, here here we go again. Here, here's another piece of this, and we have a context for this that she doesn't. So what do we, what do we do with it? You know, and and, and they wind up, you know, coming up with a, a plan to you know get copies and preserve it and and whatnot. And everybody's just going to shut up, you know, from this point and protect this or that. And so, you know, the, the high jump thing becomes a, a factor that will get picked up on later and it'll, it'll actually merge that stream will, will merge into what becomes kind of a river that relates to um, a lot of kind of obscure documentary evidence for a Nazi nuclear program where they were producing uh, fissionable uranium without a reactor again this this is just research you can find that they were into this uh, they were they were they had plans at least to weaponize it uh, this is part of the reason why the Allies didn't think that the Nazis had nuclear capability, uh, because of you know the, the the primitive nature and the the very few reactors you know that they came across. Well, it turns out they didn't actually need that process. Uh, it comes out in the transcripts uh, very cryptically from Farm Hall, which is where the British you know housed a number of the the German Nazi scientists, you know connected with nazi works you know world war ii and taped their conversations you can buy those transcripts you know and, uh, th- this is obtainable stuff you know all these different pieces about who gets away and, and who who knows what and who saw what sort of experiment and that kind of thing and so that you know the, the book's gonna gonna ask the question well if they had nuclear capability could they use that to power a vehicle you know could they marry this to to the, the delta wing craft that you know, people knew that they were working on. And if they didn't, did, did we do it? You know, using their, their technology and operation paperclip. Again, there, there's a circumstantial paper trail for all of that stuff that I use in the book uh, as part of a much bigger scheme 
that that the reader's going to be aware of, but the characters won't necessarily be aware of. Yeah, they they leave some things out that um, it, that kills off one part of the conspiracy, but then lends fuel to another part of it. You know, and, and to me that that's what the documentary stuff that, that's what makes it fun, because there's enough there to build circumstantial cases in a number of directions. Even if you don't take the direction, you know that, that you know the the modern conspiracy sort of culture has erected, um, and that that's another reason why I like to throw in you know all this stuff to, to find stuff that it, it exists. I mean, you could actually go pull this out of a drawer and read it. You know, there it is, an X Y Z archive box. You know, but again, the the, the trick is, or the you know the it, it just becomes fodder for a what if kind of scenario that can go in any number of directions. And and I do a lot of that in the portent. Readers are going to get into archaeology. They're going to get into why uh, not just anti-Semite scholars, but other scholars in the late 19th century, early 20th century thought that Jesus wasn't a Jew, that he was an Aryan. Uh, you, I spent a lot of time, uh, lot, lot, I did a lot of research reading on, on what we call, you know, Aryan mythology or Aryan racial theory, uh, which, which is more is bigger than the, the Nazi on an Arabi. It, it's, it, it goes into India and why, you know, basically how racial theorists during and after the age of discovery when all these other peoples are being discovered and why wow we, you know where are they in the bible they're not there what in the world's going on you know all this stuff how all these racial theories developed and what was done with them and and again there, there's just there's there's it's, it's kind of like the facade there's another dozen pools to play in when it comes to subject matter that i pull you know real discussions out of you know discussions over translating this or that text or this artifact or whatever and then marry it to modern technology and, and come up with a story. I just think that's that's interesting for the reader because, again, once you – it's kind of like one of those Sherlock Holmes things. When, once you get to the end and you see how the things were connected, you go back. And it's like, yeah, that's real. This thing's over here real. And if, if those two things did meet, you know, that, that this is what they – you know, that what they would produce if you married them. This is where you'd go, you know, and, you know that sort of thing. I, I think it becomes interesting and entertaining for the reader. And, and for me, again, you know, if I were this you know, supernatural evil mind that I, I was aware of whole, a whole lot of things that most people aren't, uh, what would I use to influence thinking and move the herd, to drive them to the place that I want them to be? So it's very useful for that, that kind of technique, that, that reason. Neff is, is very wealthy, uh, uber wealthy. You don't find out until the end of the story how he got all that money. He's a character that Brian and Melissa find difficult to trust, not really because of, of any you know, character issue, but because he talks about himself pretty cryptically. And you, know, he, you can tell he doesn't really want people to know, where did my money come from? What am I up to? What am I doing? He, but he more or less just, you know, gets intertwined in, in their lives, and he's actually been seeking them. He's actually, you know, he didn't didn't have names, didn't have a location, but he, there were some things that he discovers uh, about these two un, unidentified people that become important to him, and eventually tracks them down. And then Brian and Melissa are in this situation. Well, like, you know, whose side is this guy on? You know, do we trust him or not? And, and he, he's a really important character uh, in, in the overall scope of the story. But, you know, I don't want to say too much more than that because, you know, the, I, I want the reader to just not know where this guy is at until they find out, you know, what, what's up with this guy, at least in part. And then at the end, they, they even discover more about him. Yeah, Mantello, even even though he gets killed off in the first book, is a character in this, in the second one. You know where he his work. If you readers, those who have read the facade, Mantello is a priest in, in Castle Gandolfo. He's an astronomer and a Jesuit, and he he gets killed by, um, you know, I, I guess I won't tell you know how he gets killed, but he gets killed right after he has delivered a message to someone. Um, that you don't know who he sent it to. Okay. Well, in this book, in number two, you find out who he sent it to. And it, it's, it's, you know, I think I can say it's, it's kind of unexpected, you know, who, who winds up on the other end of this message, but Mantello's work in terms of astronomy and religion, uh, signs in the sky kind of thing becomes really central to the portent. And it's mediated to the reader through the person who gets the message on the other side. That again, it is not really anybody you'd expect, to be communicating with a Jesuit astronomer, you know, of, of Mantello's stature. Sabi is, is in many ways, um, you know, the, the spiritual center 
of the book. I mean, Brian is that a little bit, but Brian has his own his own insecurities, his own self doubt. Uh, you know, in terms of doing the right thing, Brian is going to do the right thing even when it hurts, even when it's stupid. <laughs> You know, he that's just who he is. He's predictable in that sense, very willing to sacrifice. But it, still, Sabi, the new character, is in many ways the, the orienting point for how we should be thinking about what God is up to in, in this mess or this, this thing that we're all frightened of. And we don't know what's going to happen. And he is para, a paraplegic. Uh, he's Eastern Orthodox. Uh, he was a soldier. You know, his his paralysis comes from an injury. You know, that's that's military war related. Um, was in a very terrible situation uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, basically, a uh, you know put away in a in a home and and routinely abused. But he uh, he gets delivered, you know, from that situation by a a very overtly point of divine intervention, and that sort of brings him back. You know, as a as a Christian, brings him back, you know, to to a, a position of faith, where basically all he he can really do is is pray and meditate and and advise. And he again, he is the he's the spiritual focus of of the group in which he finds himself in. And and I think there's a line, there's a line. Uh, the, the group is called McLot, uh, which means Haven, and they don't really make any big decisions without unanimous consent but especially sabi if sabi thinks we should do this then we do it if he, if he doesn't then we don't so he he's almost really a, a, a leader you know of this group despite his physical uh, infirmities he is is the villain you know from from the first book uh, but he's actually more of a villain than the characters even realize but he is looking for them for an altogether different reason and again, when he is able to engineer circumstances that force uh, Brian and Melissa to come out of hiding, then that, that's when you get to see what, what he's really all about. You know, he, he is the one that basically just puts it all on the table. You're wondering what I'm up to. Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you all the details. and I'm even going to tell you why. And I'm even going to tell you how. Because I want it to hurt. You know, again, you're, you interest me because I enjoy watching you suffer. So he puts Brian under these this psychological, spiritual, these constraints, this box that he constructs for him and forces him to live in. And uh, that comes out a lot uh, in, in the book. Again, he is, he's the intelligent evil that, that uh, is just lurking in the background constantly. I liked the idea of, again, pretending to be the intelligent evil mastermind. You know, that, not that you know, I want my own main character, who is me in a lot of respects in my college years, not, not that I wanted to make myself suffer. But I, I liked that because of the approach, the idea, that in, in the first one, you know, you sort of get to play God, you know, you're, you're, and, and you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this to expose evil. But in this one, it's like, okay, we're going to go through this exercise because I do fear that a lot of Christians don't think deeply enough about what they believe. And I fear that evil can use our own thinking against us and our own Bible against us if we don't think well. And so I liked doing that because I do want to alert readers to these possibilities and to get them to say, well, maybe I should put more time into studying the text of scripture instead of just running with an idea and assuming it to be true. I think when people do that, it's not a sinister thing. I think it's more of a reflex. It just is what it is. But, you know, I was able to, in this book, in the portent, and because I approached it the way I did, I think it, it does provide a service to to get people in a different way. Again, using fiction, and again, you, you know that it's the evil guy, you know, pulling the, the switches here. But in a in a different way to get people to think about, well, okay, yeah, I believe that, but, you know, I could see where that could really be off, you know, and, and if, if I'm wrong here, then boy, I, you know, somebody could use that to do this, th this thing over here, you know, how, to show how ideas are connected to each other and where they lead or could lead, I think is a good exercise. I, I want to do at, at least a, a, a third one. I, I won't know if there'll be one beyond that until I'm into the third one. Uh, it's going to be heavily uh, Egyptian in orientation, uh, ancient Egypt, archaeoastronomy. Uh, I'm tentatively titling it the Nexus, uh, which you know speaks to uh, the interconnectivity of ancient sites around the world, but 
Egypt's going to be a key uh, to understanding those connections. So that's about all I can I can say about it now. It, it, it'll it'll riff off you know the the astronomy stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll kick that can down the road a little bit. Uh, I can't say too much uh, about you know the, the the dark side of it because you know if people haven't read the portent then you know I might ruin something there. But uh, those are the basics. You know, pastors, ministers, uh, teachers at all levels of of sort of shielding people from information that's in the Bible or dismissing really good questions people have about the Bible. Oh, that's not important. You know, it's not about Jesus. I, you know, you know, whatever. Just just to deflect interest away from Scripture to me is just a very bad idea.